Live from Miami Beach, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering Veeam on 2019. Brought to you by Veeam. Welcome back to Miami, everybody. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. My name is Dave Vellante. I'm here with my co-host, Peter Burris. Two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage of Veeam on 2019. They selected the Fontainebleau Hotel in hip, swanky Miami. Tad Brockway is here. He's the corporate VP of Azure Storage. Good to see you. Yeah, great to see you. Thanks so for having me. So you work for a pretty hip company, Microsoft, Azure is uh, where all the growth <laughs> is, 70 plus percent growth. And uh, you're doing some cool stuff with storage, so let's, you know, let's get into it. Sure. Let's start with your role and kind of your swim lane, if you will. Sure, so our, our team is responsible for our storage platform that includes the, our disk service for IaaS virtual machines, our scale out storage, we call Azure Blob Storage. We have support for files as well with a product called Azure Files. We support SMB-based files, NFS-based files. Um, we have a partnership with NetApp. We're bringing Azure NetApp files is what we call it. We're bringing NetApp on tap into our data centers, delivering that as a first party service. We're pretty excited about that. Yep. And, um, and then a number of other services around those core capabilities. And, and that's really grown over the, 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 the last several years. Optionality is really the watchword there, right? Giving customers right. as many options, file, block, object, et cetera. Exactly. How would you summarize the Azure storage strategy? Yeah, so, and, and I like that point, optionality and, 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 and really flexibility for customers to approach storage in whatever way makes sense. So there, there, there may be customers, there are customers who are developing brand new cloud-based apps. Maybe they'll go straight to object storage or blobs. There are many customers who have data sets and workloads on-prem that are NFS-based and SMB-based. They can bring those assets to our cloud as well. We also have, we're, we're the only vendor in the industry that has a server side implementation of HDFS. So for analytics workloads, we bring file system semantics for those large scale uh, HDFS workloads, we bring them into our storage environment so that the customer can uh, do all of the, the things that are possible with the file system, create hierarchies, hierarchies, <laughs> hierarchies for organizing their data, use ACLs to protect their data assets, um, and, and that's a pretty revolutionary thing that we've done. But your, to, your, to your point though, optionality is the key, and being able to do all of those things for all of those different access types, and then being able to do that for multiple economic tiers as well, from hot storage all the way down to our, our archive storage tier. And, and Todd, I sure changed you on your title, because you're also responsible for media and, and edge, right? So that includes uh, Azure Stack, is that right? Right, so we have Azure Stack as well within our, within our area and Databox and Databox Edge. Those are, Databox Edge and Azure Stack are our, uh, our Edge uh, portfolio platforms uh, so the customers can bring cloud-based applications right into their on-prem environments. Peter, you were making a point this morning about the, the cloud and, and its distributed nature. Can you make that point? I'd love to hear Tad's re reaction and response. Yes. So, so Tad, we've been arguing in our research here at Wikibon Silicon Angle for quite some time that mm. uh, the common parlance, the common concept of cloud, move everything to the center was wrong. Mm. Uh, and we've been saying this for probably four or five years. And we believe very strongly that the cloud really is a technology for further distributing. Mm -hmm. data, further distributing uh, computing, so that you can locate data proximate to the activity that it's going to support. But right. do so in a way that's coherent, comprehensive, that's right. and quite frankly, competent. That's and that's right. what's been missing in the industry for a long time. So yeah. if you look at it that way, uh, tell us a little bit about how that approach, or that thinking informs what you're doing with Azure. And specifically, one of the other challenges is how does then data services impact that, so we'll come to that in a Gosh, second, I'm sure. Yeah, great, great insight, by the way. I, I, I agree that the, the assumption had been that everything is going to move to these large data centers in the cloud, and, and I think that is happening for sure, but what we're seeing now is that there's a greater understanding of the longer term requirements for compute, and that there are, there are a bunch of workloads that need to be in proximity to where the data is being generated and to where it's being acted upon. And there are tons of scenarios here. 
Um, manufacturing is an example where we have one of our customers who's using our Databox Edge uh, product to monitor a, a, uh, an assembly line. As parts come out of the assembly line, our Databox Edge device is used with a camera system attached to it, AI inferencing to detect defects in the assembly line and then stop the assembly line with very low latency where a round trip back to, you know, a round trip to the cloud and back to do all the AI inferencing right. and then do the command and control to stop the assembly line, that would just be too much round trip time. So in many different verticals, we're seeing this awareness that there are very good reasons to have compute and storage on-prem, and so that's why we're investing in Azure Stack and Databox Edge in particular. Now, now you asked, well how does data factor into that? Because it turns out in a world of IoT and, and uh, uh, basically an infinite number of devices over time, more and more data is going to be generated that data needs to be archived somewhere, so that's where public cloud comes in and all the elasticity and the scale economies of cloud. But in terms of processing that data, you need to be able to have a, uh, a nice, uh, a strong connection between what's going on in the public cloud and then what's going on on-prem. So the killer scenario here is AI, right? Being able to grab data as it's being generated on-prem Route it into a product like Databox Edge. And Databox Edge is a, a storage gateway device, so you can you can map your your uh, your cameras in the in the use case I mentioned, or for other scenarios, you can route the data directly into a file share, an NFS blob or SMB file share, drop into into Databox Edge. Then Databox Edge will automatically copy it over to the cloud, and but but allow for local processing. To, to local applications as if it were, in fact it is local, running uh, in a hot SSD NVMe tier. And the beautiful thing about Databox Edge, it, it includes an FPGA device to do AI inference offloading. So this is a very modern device that intersects a whole bunch of things all in one very simple uh, self-contained unit. Then the data flows into the cloud where it can be archived for uh, you know, permanently in the cloud, and uh, and then AI models can be updated using the elastic scale of cloud compute. Then those models can be back on, brought back on prem for enhanced processing over time. So you can sort of see this virtuous cycle happening over time where the edge is getting smarter and smarter and smarter. It's pretty okay, cool so stuff. so that's what you mean kind of, when you talked about the intelligent <laughs> cloud and the intelligent edge, I was going to ask you, you just kind of explained it. That's right. And you can automate this, use machine intelligence to actually determine where the data should land. That's right. And, and minimize uh, human involvement. You talked about yes. driving marginal cost of storing your data to zero, yeah. um, which I've always, we've always talked about you know, doing that from the standpoint of reducing or even eliminating labor costs through automation, but you've also got some cool projects to reduce the cost of, of, of the cost for storing a bit. Yeah. Maybe you could talk about some of those projects a little bit. That's right, so, and, and that was mentioned in the keynote this right. morning. And, and so we're, we're, our vision is that we want for our customers to be able to keep their artifacts that they store on our cloud platform for thousands of years. And if you think about you know, sort of the history of humanity, that's not outside the question at all. In fact, wouldn't it be great to have everything that was ever generated by humankind for the thousands of years of, of modern uh, or human history? We'll be able to do that with technology that we're developing. So we're investing in technology to store uh, data uh, virtually indefinitely on glass, as well as even in DNA. And by, uh, by investing in those uh, advanced uh, types of storage, that is going to allow us to drive that, uh, that marginal cost down to zero over time. Epigenetic storage systems. <laughs> I want to come back to this notion of services though and where the data is located. So sure. uh, again, from our, from our research, what we see is we see, as you said, data being proximate or being housed proximate to where it's created and acted upon. That's right. Uh, but that increasingly businesses want the options to be able to replicate that, or replicate's the wrong word, it's a loaded word, mm. but to be able to do something similar in some other location if the action is taking place in that location too. Yeah. That's what Kubernetes is kind of about, and serverless computing, and some of these other things are about. Mm -hmm. 
but it's more than just the data. It's also, the, it's the data, it's the data services, it's the metadata associated with yeah. that. How do you foresee at Microsoft and what role might Veeam play in this mm. notion of a, a greater federation of mm. data services that are made, that make possible like a policy driven backup, restore, data protection architecture. I love that's it. That's really driven by you know, what the business needs and where the action's taking place. Is that something yeah. you're seeing in a direction that you see it going? Yeah, absolutely, and so, so, so I'll talk conceptually about our strategy in that regard and where we see that going for customers, and then maybe we can come back to the Veeam partnership as well, because I think this is all connected up. The, the, our approach to storage, our, our, our view is that storage should be, um, you should be able to drop all of your data assets into a single storage system, like we talked about, that supports all the different protocols that are required, can automatically tier from very hot storage all the way down to, over time, glass and DNA. And we do all of that within one storage system, and, and then the movement across those different uh, vertical and horizontal slices, that can all be done programmatically or via policy. And so, it's so customers can make a choice in the near term about how they drop their data into the cloud, but then they have a lot of flexibility to do all kinds of things with it over time. And then with that, we layer on the Microsoft uh, whole set of analytics services. So all of our analytics, all of our data and analytics products, they layer on top of this disaggregated storage system so that there can be late binding of the type of processing that's used, including AI, to reason over that data relative to where and how and when the data entered into the platform. So that sort of modularity, it really future proofs the use of data over the long haul. We're really excited about that. And, and then, uh, and then that, those data assets can, buy, can then be replicated, uh, to use your term, to other regions around the globe as well, using our, our backbone, right? So the customers, customers can use our network, our network is, is a customer's network. And then the way that docks into the partnership with Veeam is that just as I mentioned in the keynote this morning, data protection is a use case that is, is just fundamental to enterprise IT. We can make, together with customers and with, with Veeam, we can make data protection better today using the cloud and with the work that Veeam has done in integrating with O365, the integration from there into Azure Storage, and then over time, customers can start down this path of something that feels sort of mundane and, and, uh, and this has you know, been a part of daily life at Enterprise IT, and then that becomes an entry point into a broader long-term data strategy in the cloud. So pretty but, cool. But following up on this, so if we, if we agree that data is not going to be entirely centralized, but it's going to be more broadly distributed, and that there is a need for a common set of capabilities around data protection, which is a very narrowly defined term today, and is probably going to evolve over the next few years. Yeah, I agree with that. We think that, and this is what I want to test, we think you're going to have a federated model for data protection that provides for local autonomous data protection activities mm. that is consistent with the needs of those uh, those local data assets, but mm. under a common policy-based mm. framework that a company like Veeam's going to be able to provide. What do you think? So we're, for, first of all, uh, a, a core principle of ours is that while we're creating these platforms for large data sets to move into Azure, the, the most important thing is that customers own their own data. So it's, it's kind of this, there's, there's this uh, balance that has to be reached in terms of cloud scale and cloud, the federated nature of cloud and these common platforms and ways of approaching data, while simultaneously making sure that customers and users are in charge of their own data assets. Right. So those are the principles that we'll use to guide our innovation moving forward, and then um, I agree, I think we're going to see a lot of innovation when it comes to taking advantage of cloud scale, cloud flexibility, and economics, but then also empowering customers to take advantage of these things, but do it on their terms. I think there's, like, the future's pretty bright in that regard. And the operative term there is their terms. I mean, you, you, obviously Microsoft has always had a, a large on-prem install base and a software estate, and so you've embraced, you know, hybrid, uh, to use that term. Uh, mm -hmm. with your strategies. You've never sort of run away from it. You never said everything's going to oh. go into the cloud. That's right. Um, and, and that's now evolving uh, to the edge. 
Um, and, and so, my question is, what are the big gaps, not necessarily organizationally or process-wise, but mm. from a technology standpoint that the industry generally and Microsoft specifically mm. have to fill to make that sort of federated vision a reality? Well, there's, I mean, we're just at the early stages of all this for sure. In yeah. fact, uh, as, as we talked about this morning, the, uh, the notion of hybrid, which started out with use cases like backup, uh, is, is rapidly evolving t more, toward a more sort of modern, enduring view. I, I think in a lot of ways, hybrid was viewed as this kind of temporary stop along a path to cloud. And back to by our some. earlier discussion, yeah, by some, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there's a, a debate you all are having there. Uh, but uh, what, what we're seeing is um, the emergence of, of edge as being an enduring location for compute and for data, and that's where the concept of intelligent edge comes in. So the, the model that I talked about earlier today is hybrid about, is about extending on-prem data center assets into the cloud Whereas Intelligent Edge is taking cloud concepts and bringing them back to the edge in an enduring way. So it's pretty, it's pretty neat stuff. And, and a big part of that is that much of the data, if not most of the data, or the vast majority even, might stay at the edge uh, exactly. permanently. And of That's course you want to run your models up in the cloud. That's but, right. And at least for real-time processing, yes. Right, right. You just don't have the time to do the round trip. So. That's right. Cool. All right, Ted, uh, I'll give you a last word. Um, Azure, direction, your relationship with Veeam, the, the conference, take your pick. Yeah, well, I thank you. Um, Welcome. Thanks, thanks uh, great to be here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, the, the partnership with Veeam and then this conference in particular is great because I really love the idea of, of solving a very real and uh, urgent problem for customers today and then helping them along that journey to the cloud. So that's one of the things that makes my job uh, a great one. Well, we talk about digital transformation all the time in theCUBE. Uh, it's, it's real, it's not just a buzzword. It can't happen without the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's not all in the central location. It's extending now to it other locations. And, your data assets. And, and where your data yeah. wants to live. So Ted, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. It's great to have you. Okay, thanks guys. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is Veeam on 2019, and you're watching theCUBE.